of the lecture. So the first class will focus on introduction to Keras and then on convolutional neural networks and their application to semantic segmentation of bioimages. Deep learning has become a popular machine learning technique in the recent years. It has been widely used in data science and is increasingly used in biology. The number of biological publications that use or reference deep learning has grown and continues to grow exponentially. However, and many of the existing already deep learning implementations in biology are listed in the first of the links uh, provided. However, uh, existing books on deep learning and available online courses traditionally use non-biological examples, uh, such as MNIST shown here or CIFAR-10. In both these classification examples, image classification examples, an entire uh, image is assigned a label from a finite set of labels of size 10. Uh, we will see later in today's class and subsequent classes that in typical bioimage processing applications, a different kind of question is addressed. Not the entire image, but every pixel in the image is assigned a label. So these examples, non-biological examples, actually do not represent the computational challenges that arise in typical bioimage processing applications. The semantic segmentation uh, is, uh, has been taught in more advanced courses, the computer vision courses. However, even those courses consider only non-biological examples. Our course will attempt to uh, fill this gap and other similar gaps by systematically considering biological examples that have been uh, implemented in BioWolf and uh, make use of deep learning. When selecting uh, the examples for this uh, course, I followed the following criteria. First, the examples must cover a wide range of biological <coughs> applications. Second, they must represent all the major types of deep learning networks. And finally, they must be implemented in Keras, which is one of the most simple and most popular deep learning frameworks. Uh, for some of the examples, implementations also exist in other popular deep learning frameworks, such as uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch. However, I found Keras to be particularly good for teaching purposes due to its simplicity. The code written in Keras may be sometimes uh, twice as short as the code with similar functionality written in uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch. Any questions so far? No. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I have a question. Okay. Um, I thought Keras was kind of built into TensorFlow. Is it like a wrapper or what's what's the relationship? Between we, we will come to it in the, uh, okay. one of subsequent slides. We'll discuss it in more details. And you can ask them question if you still have one. Okay, thanks. Okay, any more questions? Okay, I proceed to the next slide. This table uh, summarizes the examples to be discussed in, in the current iteration of the course. Compared to the previous iteration, two more examples will be added, number six and number seven. The purpose of this slide is to illustrate that the examples, these examples in the table do actually meet the criteria that I just listed in the previous slide. Indeed, first of all, the examples cover a wide range of biological applications. Number one and number four will focus on bioimage processing. Number two, three, and six will focus on computational genomics. And number five and seven on drug molecule design. And second, 
the examples represent a number of major types of deep learning frameworks. It's first of all, the convolutional uh, network. Uh, the networks that are used uh, in a number of applications, but primarily for image process. In the example number one, we will discuss how convolutional neural network can be used to perform semantic segmentation of bioimages that come from, from the fly brain connectome project. Second is uh, recurrent neural networks or RNNs. The recurrent neural networks are used primarily for analysis of sequence data uh, together with one dimensional convolutional neural networks that can also be used for the same purpose in some cases. In example number two, we will see how recurrent neural network can be applied to uh, uh, a task that arises in epigenomics, uh, the prediction of the function of non-coding DNA, which is DNA outside of genes. Third type of networks is autoencoders. Autoencoders are also used for a number of purposes, but their primary use is for reduction of dimensionality of data by extracting essential features, relatively small subset of essential features from the data. So you can actually use those features only without significant loss of information about your data. In class number three, we will see how uh, uh, autoencoder can dramatically reduce the number of uh, features in the gene expression data that come from the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas project. Next example would be uh, generative, generative adversarial networks. Uh, they are used, uh, actually one of the most hottest areas of deep learning right now, uh, uh, they comprise two subnetworks. Uh, the uh, oops, sorry, uh, two subnetworks: the generator and the discriminator. And uh, the uh, in example number four, we will see how these networks can be used to generate synthetic images. Those are bioimages that are of practical importance. They are useful, but they cannot be produced experimentally because of a number of limitations of experiment. Next example is uh, reinforcement learning networks. They will be used for uh, de novo drug molecule design. And that network that we will discuss will also comprise two subnetworks. It also will be composite network. Uh, it will comprise generator and predictor. And finally, the last two uh, examples will focus on so-called graph neural networks. Uh, those networks are very different from all the previously mentioned networks in that the graph neural network takes as input not a regular structure such as image or sequence, which is uh, basically a, a lattice. Uh, the, the image is a rectangular lattice of pixels, but graph neural networks takes, uh, take as input irregular structure, the graph. And that graph may represent, for example, uh, gene regulation network. And that would be example number six, where we will see how uh, uh, the graph convolutional network can be used to classify, uh, classify different types of cancer. And alternatively, the graph may represent a molecule of chemical compound or a drug and that will be example number seven. Uh, that uh, network uh, called message passing network will be used for prediction of uh, properties of drug or chemical compound molecules. Uh, finally, it's worth mentioning that the examples one, two, uh, uh, six and seven represent supervised approach to machine learning they will require ground truth labels for training. Examples uh, three and four <coughs> represent <coughs> unsupervised. 
approach the machine learning. And everyone, please mute their session. We can hear you on this talk. Please mute your session. Can you please mute your session? Maybe the organizer can, can mute to certain people, mute yeah. everyone. Yes. Uh, Gennady, can you try that? Because I don't have the privilege yes, to trying, mute I'm anyone. Trying to yeah, I'm trying now. So I was just unmuted by the host, actually. I was muted before and it said that I received a message that I was being unmuted. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, okay. I think you have unmuted everyone. Can yes, you I, did. I did, I did. Now I asked uh, to mute again. I don't know what, uh, ask, I only can ask to, according to the uh, to button that I created. It's just asking to unmute. But it actually it looks like it's actually unmuted. Uh, anyway, now it looks like quiet. I can continue. So uh, uh, finally, the example number five will uh, 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 will be performed using uh, uh, reinforcement approach to machine learning, which is the third camp of methods uh, and delays somewhere in between the full supervision and complete lack of predefined limits. That's it about this slide. Any questions? For the number six, uh, the graph, is it uh, the graph containing nodes and ages? Um, yes, exactly. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, Thanks. yes. So, yeah. Any other questions? No, okay. I proceed to the next slide. Oh, one more point that uh, uh, actually example number six, we'll uh, use the same data as example number three. The data comes from the cancer genome atlas. So in a way, example six can be regarded as an extension of example three. And likewise, example seven will use the same data as example five. It also can be regarded as an extension of example five. So after this uh, pretty general overview, Let's start from very basics. We start introductory part, introduction to Keras. And uh, well, let's consider the simplest possible uh, neural network, uh, which is called Perceptron. And this is a model of just one individual artificial neuron. Uh, the input to the Perceptron would be a vector of numbers, and the output would be a single number uh, or uh, Scalar. In deep learning, uh, all the process data items tend to be regarded as tensors. In general, you can think of a tensor as multidimensional matrix. However, even a vector can be regarded as a tensor, the one dimensional tensor. And even a scalar can be regarded as a tensor, the zero dimensional tensor. So the perceptron takes as input a tensor X outputs tensor Z and transforms actually X to Z. It transformation is performed in two steps. In the first step, uh, a weighted sum of elements of input tensor X is computed plus certain bias. And the result is assigned to the intermediate also one zero dimensional tensor Y. At the second step, the Certain non-decreasing activation function is applied to the tensor Y, and the result is assigned to the output tensor Z. The weights and biases here are adjustable parameters. They can be adjusted automatically during the training procedure, whereas uh, the activation is, uh, uh, does not have adjustable parameters. It will, will be some always non-decreasing function as maybe linear, but in practically useful cases, it is usually non-linear, like this one, uh, which is called sigmoid function, or 
this one piecewise linear, also non-decreasing, uh, called a, a ReLU, a rectified linear unit, or there is another, a number of other predefined activation functions in Keras, you can choose any, or you can even define your own custom activation function if you know what you're doing. This simple example also allows to make a distinction between what in deep learning is termed parameters and hyperparameters. More specifically, the weights and the bias, uh, which are adjusted automatically by the Keras training procedure, are termed parameters. All the other characteristics of the network, including the number of weights and our choice of the activation function are termed hyperparameters. They are not adjustable automatically during the training procedure. Any questions? Sorry, no. I have a quick one about, so the steps of data processing, uh, so it's all what you always are going to have this linear transformation first, and then you'll have whatever you choose to add next, like wh whether it's the nonlinear or a, a linear transformation that, and that's all, is that the steps in between the different layers or is this? No, no, this, this is steps for just one single uh, neuron. And okay. we will have multiple neurons. Of course, those steps will be repeated multiple times if we have consecutive neurons which process take each subsequent neuron or layer of neurons takes as input the output from the previous layer or previous neuron then that will, operation will be uh, repeated multiple times okay so you. potentially you have a lot of nonlinearity uh, in, in your data I'll, I'll come i'll return to it to discussion thank you Okay, if there are other questions, uh, you may ask after next slide uh, about uh, the question about previous slides. I have just introduced uh, Perceptron as the simplest structural model of a network. But from the functional point of view, Perceptron can also be regarded as the simplest binary classification algorithm. And this slide presents uh, implementation of this algorithm in Keras. This slide is wonderful by two reasons. First, because it's arguably the simplest possible training program to be written in Keras. And second, because this simplest program, nevertheless, illustrates the four major processing steps that will be found in any other more sophisticated program to be written in Keras, at least in any program to be discussed in this course. And these steps are header, getting data, defining the model, and running the model. Let's look at each of these steps in more detail. The header step, in our case, is represented by a number of uh, Python import statements. I assume that you are familiar with Python, with basics of Python. It's requirement of the course, so we should be familiar with uh, Python imports, but what may not be obvious to you is that the objects that we import from the Keras library actually come from a different deep learning framework, which is called a backend. So what is the backend? Uh, Keras itself is actually a wrapper, which addressing the question of one of the uh, uh, participants. Uh, it is a wrapper, it is high level library, which does not uh, has its own support for low level operations, such as tensor multiplications, convolutions that we will discuss and so on. Instead, Keras borrows this support from well-optimized uh, uh, deep learning framework, which is called a backend. The default backend for Keras is TensorFlow. And if you are using the most recent version of Keras, then TensorFlow will be the only backend available for you. However, if you are trying to run program, some application that was developed using older version of Keras, starting 2.3.1 or, or earlier, older, even older, then you may have more backend options, 
such as Theano or as, as CNTK, Cognitive Network Toolkit. And in order to choose backend, to change backend from the TensorFlow, uh, from the default TensorFlow to something else, you have to edit this file. Now, next step is getting data. For this highly simplified model, I will generate, uh, use uh, a, a synthetic training data set that will be generated on the fly. More specifically, my training data set will comprise a data matrix X, X train, and a vector of binary labels Y train. The matrix X train will be designed according to the following rule. First, it will have 1,000 rows, also known called samples. And second, for each of the rows uh, will be a vector of 10 random numbers. Uh, the vector of binary labels will be designed according to the following rules. First, it will have uh, the number of elements equal to the number of rows in matrix X. And second, a label to a given row assigned to a given row will be set to one if some of the random numbers in the row is positive and it will be assigned to zero otherwise. So these are my rules for designing labels, but the model is not aware of my rules. Our model is supposed to learn these rules automatically, uh, directly from the data uh, during the training procedure. Now let's talk about the model. The model will be defined as a graph uh, with vertices x, y, z, and connections between the vertices. The connections will be transformations uh, or edges between vertices will be transformations between the tensors. In Keras, to perform transformations between data tensors, a special kind of objects is used, which is called layer. The term layer originated from layer of neurons, but luckily Keras allows me to apply the same abstraction to modeling of just one single neuron, which I will do. For this model, I will use two layers, <clears throat> uh, 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 the dense layer, and uh, which transforms uh, X to Y, and the activation layer, which transforms tensor Y to tensor Z. Both these layers are imported from the Keras uh, library. Besides, imported will be also two other objects, the input and the model object. The input object uh, produces the uh, tensor X from my input data. And the model object stores- <laughs> Please, please unmute, mute yourself. Ming Yi, I think you need to mute yourself. Okay, uh, so uh, the model object stores the entire graph. Definition of the model will be completed after we compile it. Uh, compilation of the model is performed by calling the method compile. And compilation means basically checking that all the items that we will need for running the model are present and are in place and are defined correctly. In order for the model to compile successfully, we need to specify at least two more items of information. The first is loss, which is a loss function. That will be a function of weights of adjustable parameters that we will be minimizing during the training procedure. Actually, training is minimization of the loss. Keras has a number of predefined uh, loss functions. So it suffices just to specify the name of appropriate loss function. I choose here mean squared error. The other important item is optimizer. That would be the particular algorithm 
that we will use for minimization of the loss. Again, Keras has a number of predefined optimizer, uh, optimizers, and it suffices just to specify the name of optimizer. For this case, I selected SGD, stochastic gradient descent. We will discuss it in subsequent uh, classes. Finally, running of the model. Uh, it is performed by calling the method fit that will take as input X train and Y train data, and then will automatically adjust uh, the weights and store them in a certain file. But before we do that, we have to define the output file where the adjusted weights will be stored. And that file is termed checkpoint. Uh, so I define here uh, the file. I set a name to perceptron.h5. Extension h5 means that the file will be in HDF5 format. And now we run the training procedure. The training will be performed in a number of iterations called epochs. For here, I use 100 epochs. And after each epoch, the updated weights will be stored in the checkpoint file using a function that is called callback. That function is called after each iteration. In summary, this slide introduces a number of uh, important terms. I will go through them once again, since they will be used in subsequent uh, uh, examples. First, we introduced a backend. This is a low level, uh, the uh, deep learning framework that provides a low level support uh, to Keras. It's a layer. Layer is uh, uh, basically, it's a uh, uh, object that perform uh, transformation uh, between the tensors. Loss. Uh, it's a function of weights that will be minimized during the training procedure. Optimizer. Optimizer is a particular algorithm that will be used for minimization of the loss. Checkpoint. It's a file where we will store updated weights. Epoch. One iteration of the training procedure. Callback. A function that is called after each uh, epoch or after each iteration of training. And in this particular case, that function will update the weights in the checkpoint file. And also we mentioned two methods, compile for compiling the model and feed for training the model. Any questions about this slide? I have a question uh, about the, the loss function. Uh, the mean square error is usually uh, is traditionally used more in a regression setting, and here's more of a classification setting. So, is that such a distinction for uh, in, in neural networks at all? Uh, if you should be on the on the loss function, about uh, what function? A uh, loss function. Loss function. Well, loss function it depends on it. Uh, it will depend on a particular task. Uh, for this one, it does probably does matter for, because the example is extremely simple. But in general, you can specify depending on your particular purpose, on what you want to do in, by the network, you choose appropriate loss function. Uh, I guess my question was more uh, because this seems more of a classification test, like a binary thing. So are there more functions that, that are um, well, well designed for a classification oh, thing? Excuse me. Uh, uh, I suggest that you ask questions only about the current slide or maybe previous slide. More general questions, so let's postpone them till the end of the lecture because it's not relevant to the, to the current slide. Okay? okay. Any other questions? Uh, is there is there like a way to know all the optimizers? You know, here you have the SGD. So um, is, that, is that possible to see other, you know? Of course, options? of course. We will we'll actually use other optimizers during the course. And okay, thank you. Yes, yes, there will be a number. There's Adam optimizer. There is a, a, a RMS, RMS prop optimizer that they will be used by appropriate uh, examples. But uh, here I use SGD. For this extremely simple example, it doesn't matter what optimizer uh, you use. E either one will work. Any one will work. Okay, so one you, more thing. So the dense in the in the y equal dense something. The the one is uh, corresponds to the y train. The, the one top. corresponds to the dimension of the output tensor. Okay. Okay. It, this you. one is scalar. So uh, the y is scalar, as you remember from the. Uh, the, from the previous chart. 
So okay. that's why one, if one specified more, I mean, in your dimension, that would dimension of the, of the output tensor. For the dense layer, is there other choice is that uh, has to be dense? Is that standard or? No, no, dense I use because it fits here. All the connections, you see, just yeah. it's just appropriate for our model. Okay. We, we choose dense because it's uh, appropriate for the uh, perceptron model. But for other applications, we'll see a number of other layers. Does it even later in this class, we will see at least four different other types of layers. Well, the check pointer, right? And it, does it store the previous uh, updates for the parameter each, each time? Or is it just updating, keep just one set of parameter, but just keep up updating the weights? Uh, the uh, weights are updated by the function called callback. I mean, and there's checkpoint. Yeah, you're right. Uh, checkpointer is the object, and you pass this object. Uh, you create, take the output file, create some somehow apply this function create object, and pass this object to the callback as as a, a keyword parameter to the fit method. But yes, it uh, that particular object performs updating of the weights after each epoch in the checkpoint file. The checkpoint file doesn't increase in size, um, right? No, uh, no, it, it will not increase because it's updated. Okay, got it. yeah, you you yeah. do not append, you update, you replace. You replace the old weights with new weights. I got it, thanks. Okay. So um, would it be possible, I have, a, I have a question of my own about this. Um, would it be possible to hybridize uh, these sorts of loss functions and minimization algorithms? Uh, perhaps, perhaps there's a way to take some sort of a hybrid approach um, with this sort yes. of thing. Yes, the answer is yes. You can define your own custom loss function. The simplest way just to use predefined already in Keras, but there is a way for you to define your own custom loss function. Keras allows you to do that. As for optimizer, I'm not sure, but of course you can use predefined optimizers. Whether or not you can specify your optimizer, probably not, but I'm not sure. All right, thank you. Okay, next slide. I just claimed that the code presented in the previous slide was the simplest possible training program to be written in Keras. And this is true, but not quite true, because actually this could be simplified a little bit further. And for that, we will do two changes to the uh, code of the previous slide. First change is that we will use a different approach to building a model, which is called sequential construct approach. In the previous uh, slide, the approach that we used was called functional API approach. So now we use a different approach. According to the sequential construct approach, the model is initially defined as empty container called sequential, which is uh, uh, imported from the library. And then we sequentially add layers to that container. We add dense, for example. The second change is that now we can pass actually activation instead of importing the activation layer and then using it as a separate layer. We can actually pass activation as a keyword parameter to the dense layer. And that simplification allows us to reduce the size of the defining model section uh, from five lines to three lines. And now it's really the simplest possible training program in here. Any other questions about this slide? Yeah, very quickly. Uh, with sequential, so the order in which you add layers is going to, it'll that will matter with directionality. Like you can't. Yeah. Yes, yes. And can you go from, so I know right now you just have one uh, neuron encoded in your in your single layer. If you were to have two layers, let's say, can you have? Is there a limit on the neuron dimensionality from one neuron to the next? 
can you or from one layer to the next can you have like eight can you go from eight to 16 or do you have to go from larger to smaller yes yes uh, you can go to any any one uh the oh. care keras automatically according to this approach let me let me discuss it in the next slide yeah, because sorry. actually I've got be, uh, uh, I, I, next slide is actually about about if you still have questions after the next slide i will be happy to address yeah sorry so no other questions about this slide okay i proceed to the next slide so let's now summarize the main lesson that we learned from the previous two slides the lesson is that there are two fundamentally different approaches to building models in Keras, the functional API approach and the sequential construct approach. The first approach explicitly mentions, uh, uses explicitly uh, the names of all the tensors. And you remember tensors X, Y, Z from the uh, perceptron. Shown in this picture is yet another uh, uh, model or network which also uses the sequential, uh, the functional API approach. I call this uh, network mini UNet because it is actually a cartoon uh, version of the realistic real UNet network model that we will discuss later in the biological example of this class. The common feature between the mini UNet and the real UNet is that they both have uh, a, a branch point. This is where the two uh, data flows merge together. And in this particular case, tensor X and tensor Y are passed as uh, uh, inputs to the layer, which I designated L2, it's a uh, uh, fake name. There are no, there is no real layers in Keras with L1, L2. I just schematically show it uh, as, as an example of a layer that takes as input a list of two tensors to two or more tensors and outputs a uh, sandwich it uh, glues the two tensors together outputs a sandwich of the two input tensors this transformation that we will discuss later is called concatenation transformation and the important point is that actually for this example we have to use all the tensor names explicitly because we cannot define this transformation L2 without explicitly mentioning the names of tensors X and Y. The second approach, the consequential concept approach does not require explicit mentioning of the uh, tensor names. It uh, uh, assumes that the output from each previous layer uh, automatically becomes the input for subsequent next layer. So the dimension doesn't matter. It will accept whatever next layer will accept whatever dimension comes from the previous layer. And uh, uh, this uh, approach, as we have seen, produces may produce somewhat shorter code, slightly shorter code. However, this uh, approach is applicable only to sequential unbranched networks. Whereas the first approach is applicable to any type of networks, both branched and unbranched. Any questions about this slide? Did I address your question? Yes. Okay. No more questions? Okay, that was easy. Uh, next slide. So far, we discussed only the training procedure uh, for uh, perceptron. And uh, uh, that procedure automatically adjusted the weights in the perceptron model and then stored those weights in the checkpoint file. But how do we actually use those stored weights? Uh, the answer is given by the, this slide, which present a perceptron prediction code. This code will use the adjusted weights uh, to predict the labels of new previously unseen data. The uh, import state, uh, the header part and the defining a model part of, uh, of this code will be exactly the same or similar, very similar to uh, the previous slides. So change will be only getting data and running the model uh, uh, sections. In getting data, 
we use uh, basically uh, the same uh, procedure for generation of synthetic data. But in this case, uh, we use X test and Y test, uh, matrix and uh, vector labels. And I use uh, for X test, I use uh, produce only 10 rows. I don't need 1000 because it's for, for, for prediction. Uh, but basically procedure is the same. And at the, uh, run, at the step of running the model, we first uh, read the weights from the checkpoint file using the method load weights. Then we uh, perform prediction. We call method uh, predict and pass it the input data tensor. And finally, we output the predicted labels, Y. And we now compare the predicted labels with ground truth labels, which are what white test, that's what we generated, that it should be, how it should be. So we compare the two uh, uh, predicted and ground truth labels. And both the codes uh, for training and for testing are available. So you can run them uh, on BioWolf uh, easily. We will look at it for those who would be interested in uh, participating in the practical part of the class, which will be the second half of the class. Uh, you can, we can pra practice with those uh, uh, codes. Any questions about this slide? No. Shown in this uh, picture is a network which is called multi-layer perceptron, also known as fully connected network. This network, this chart allows two mathematically equivalent, alternative, but mathematically equivalent interpretations. They can be found somewhere in the literature. According to the first interpretation, these color bars are termed layers. The circles in the color bars are termed, correspond to individual artificial neurons. And the arrows represent connections between different neurons. According to the second interpretation, the color bars are termed tensors. The circles on the color bars are elements, individual elements of the tensors. And the arrows represent the layers or transformations between the data tensors. For this course, I will use uh, the second interpretation. We'll adopt the second interpretation. So according to uh, uh, our interpretation layer, would be regarded roughly as transformation between data tensors. And the layer will be called hidden if it produces an intermediate data representation or intermediate data tensor, which is different from the input tensor and output tensor. So the first layer and the second layer will be hidden according to our uh, interpretation, whereas the last layer will not be hidden. And uh, uh, finally, uh, one more point is that uh, once again, that uh, both interpretations are mathematically equivalent. So whatever you use, you will come to the same equations and get the same result. Actually, both of them are simplification of uh, the uh, notion of layer. Actually, the layer is not uh, a arrows and not a bar, but it's a complex object uh, in Keras, which has a number of data fields, a number of um, uh, methods. Uh, so we just simplify uh, layer for convenience of, uh, of discussion. Uh, yet another important point to make on this slide is the notion of deep network. What network should be called deep? According to existing convention, a deep network is a network with uh, at least two hidden layers with adjustable parameters. So why is two uh, two is a critical number. That's because it was shown in these two links provided above that a uh, network with at least two layers with adjustable parameters is a universal approximator. In other words, it can approximate any function of its input. So the layers, uh, the networks shown in this slide are uh, actually deep networks, both uh, is the same, it's the same actually. So uh, it is deep because it has two hidden layers and the layers involve adjustable parameters because both layers are dense layers. 
it is important to note that when we determine whether or not a network is deep, uh, only the layers with adjustable parameters will come. So for example, the activation layer that we discussed previously, even if it is deep layer, uh, even if it is a hidden layer, it will not count because it does not involve any adjustable parameters. Any questions? Yeah, I, I have two. The first is, so is it required for the this universal approximator property that all of the input nodes be uh, connected to all of the next tensor, right? So is, is that required? Yes, actually, and, actually, the, the uh, exact statement was yes, they consider it uh, deep, uh, 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 dense, dense layers, actually. Dense is a ter uh, keras terminology. Yes, uh, it, it, in fact, they are required because uh, uh, the papers was actually uh, written before keras was created. At that time, keras did not exist. So there was no uh, notion of dense layer at that time. But in fact, they implicitly, they, yes, the answer to your question is positive. They required connection that all the uh, uh, units or uh, elements of the previous data tensor are connected to all subsequent. So then the second question is, I assume that if there's a dense, there's also a sparse and there are certain use, I assume there are certain use cases where you would not want to use dense or do we, in all the cases that we're going to discuss, are we going to assume that the connections between the different layers are dense? You can, you can actually, if you want sparse layer, you can, there are other ways. Dense itself assumes uh, dense. It is dense by definition, it's dense. But you can skip some of the connections by using other layers. There is a, a, a dropout layer, for example. We will discuss it later. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? No. Uh, so this uh, slide basically completes our introduction to Keras. And uh, the last slide uh, shows how you can practically run the codes that we just discussed, both training code for Perceptron and prediction code for Perceptron on BioWolf. You basically uh, allocate interactive, interactive session, then you load model called DL bio, DL bio example slash plus one, and then you just uh, type the name of executables. There are two, Perceptron predict and Perceptron train. Just type the name of executable and it will perform training or prediction. Are there any questions about this slide? Is the code downloadable from somewhere? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it is actually, if you, uh, uh, if you see LS uh, deal uh, by example bin, this environment variable stores the uh, path to the uh, location where the code is stored. So you can say copy from here to your current directory, you will get the code. Uh, excuse me. So we can log in by Wolf and run this example, right? Yeah. Uh, log into BioWolf, then allocate interactive session because you cannot run it from just from BioWolf. You have to allocate from the login node. You cannot, uh, you have to allocate interactive session. So you'll be on one of the compute nodes. Then you load a model. This is specifically designed model specifically for this class. And now after loading the model, you will have access to those executables and to that variable. So then you can run. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, that's it. I go to the next slide, which will start discussion of the first biological example of the course, uh, example number one, which will focus on semantic segmentation uh, with UNet, network will be net, and that will be applied to the fly brain connectome project. The ultimate goal of the fly brain connectome project is to determine the three dimensional structures of all neurons in Drosophila brain, as well as 
determine connections between the neurons. The approach taken by uh, uh, to, to produce uh, the image data involves uh, freezing the drosophila brain, slicing it into very thin layers, and then analyzing each the layer using transmission electron microscopy. Shown in this image is a very small piece of the electron microphotograph of one layer. The light areas here correspond to cross sections of individual neurons, whereas the dark spots uh, correspond to cross sections of mitochondria. What we want to do with this image is we want to produce binary segmentation shown like binary image shown in this slide where the white areas correspond to the bodies of neurons and the black pixels represent the boundaries between the neurons or neural membranes. This kind of binary segmentation is also termed uh, known as uh, semantic segmentation because uh, the regions with the same semantic meaning are assigned the same label. Uh, labels here are color encoded labels. So we have two labels, uh, uh, zero for black and uh, uh, one for white. Optionally, uh, the light areas may be colored differently for different neurons like shown here, but this is just optional. It does not mean that we assign different labels to uh, different uh, neurons. Once the uh, binary segmentations are produced for all the layers, then a stack of these 2D segmentations will be considered and the light areas will be connected across different layers, thus reconstructing the 3D structure of, uh, of the neurons. It is important to mention that when we do this kind of binary segmentation, we actually assign a label to every pixel in the image. And this task is certainly different from the uh, image classification tasks that I briefly uh, discussed in the beginning of the lecture, where not every pixel, but the entire image was assigned a single label. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the binary segmentation is produced uh, by the uh, model called UNET. And uh, before we discuss uh, uh, UNET, we will first let me give you a quick overview of UNET training code, which will be discussed in the next slide. Any questions? Okay, no questions. Uh, this uh, slide uh, provides an overview of the uh, UNET training code. The code, of course, is much more sophisticated than the trivial code for we, we looked previously at uh, for Perceptron. Uh, it uh, involves a number of uh, header uh, statements uh, and import statements, which are not shown here. They are somewhere in the top of the file. They are followed by a number of function definitions, which are also not shown here. And finally, at the very bottom of the file, we have this main function, uh, uh, which is shown. But the good news is that this main function, which actually governs execution of the entire code, involves the same uh, processing steps as we discussed previously for Perceptron. Those are header, getting data, defining the model, and running the model. Each of those steps uh, involves two or more important items. Uh, the items listed in the left, the items in the, uh, uh, shown in the red font will be discussed in details in subsequent slides, uh, such as availability of data, data augmentation. We will discuss uh, the UNET model itself, uh, four different types of layers that are used by the UNET model, and uh, the function for training the model, which is feed generator. It's different from feed. Uh, the other items shown in black are less important for now. So I can postpone their discussion till the practical part of the course. 
uh, or we will also return to them in subsequent uh, classes. Any questions about this? Uh, can you talk more more like about the how we can use the batch for the fitting, or you are going to talk talk about that in the late later slides, like about how we can use batches for the training purposes? Uh, how we can use batches of samples? Uh, yeah. Train. Yeah. Uh, uh, you uh, actually you have uh, a, a, a option to feed or feed generator uh, uh, function that performs training. You specify the batch size, like see here, batch size, uh, whatever. Oops. Anyway, uh, I don't know why. Um, so I, maybe I misunderstood your question, but you basically, so, technically, so, so, you just. Basically, I just want to like ask how we can uh, code in that way so then we can use uh, the training data in the patches. So that whole thing, how we can do that in uh, using this framework. Is that question about this slide or uh, the like like the previous slide or the next slide which you uh, in in which like you talk uh, about the batches right like where you use the training data in in batches so I, i'm just uh, saying how we can actually so can you can can you can you like talk more like about the code what we can use to do that with our data in batches like that kind of thing you specify the data in, in the matrix, and then you specify the parameter uh, batch size uh, that would be taken by the your train uh, uh, method, either feed or feed generator. And then uh, the uh, uh, training method will randomly pick a, a number of samples, uh, randomly pick a number of samples from your training data set, but the total number of samples is uh, the batch size, whatever it may be one, two, or more. And in one iteration uh, of update, it will use only this batch, but uh, it does not, we will discuss it actually in the practical part. It would be better to discuss in the practical because it moves, moves me away from the current slide, from the current presentation. So I would suggest to postpone it. Uh, sure, sure, thank you. Okay. Uh, now, this slide presents the data uh, that will be, uh, that we have available. Uh, for a UNIET model. Uh, the data comprises uh, the grayscale images and corresponding binary masks. The binary masks uh, have been produced by manually labeling the images, which is a laborious and expensive operation. For this reason, usually for bio-image processing application, only a limited number of ground truth data, uh, ground truth labels is available. Uh, for this application, I use two uh, training data sets. Uh, one comes from the International Symposium of Biomedical uh, Imaging uh, that comprises uh, 30 grayscale images together with corresponding binary masks. Uh, the other data set is uh, 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 the uh, HHMI data set. This data comes from the Flight Brain Connectome Project performed at the Harvard Hughes Medical Institute. It comprises 24 uh, grayscale images together with uh, binary masks, both for membranes and for mitochondria. These data, of course, are not sufficient uh, for performing the entire Flight Brain Connectome Project. I have examples of backup slides which illustrate how complex the real data can be. But this uh, data, nevertheless, are uh, sufficient for our illustration purposes, for teaching purposes. Uh, and, uh, uh, but because of the data uh, sizes are small in uh, machine learning, it is known that when the data set is small, uh, there is uh, a chance of overfitting the data. This is when model fits the training data too well. In particular, it uh, fits the noise that is uh, available in the data. And as a consequence, uh, the model may fail to generalize. 
uh, in other words, to make accurate predictions for new previously unseen data. Uh, there are a number of ways uh, in machine learning to fight the overfitting. One of the ways is called uh, data augmentation. The augmentation operations supported by Keras involve elastic distortion of images, uh, rotation of images with subsequent crop, uh, shear operation, skew operation, and some others. Those operations are applied simultaneously to the original grayscale image and to the corresponding binary mess. So they remain consistent. The images remain consistent with the mess. And this procedure allows us to generate a number of new data. Um, and this way effectively increase the size of our training set, data, data set and avoid, hopefully avoid overfitting. Uh, in our application, the, our implementation of the UNET, uh, this uh, augmentation increased the size by at least 20 fold. Uh, 20 was default, but you can specify any number. Um, and when you use uh, augmented data instead of their original data, the method fit that we're uh, familiar with from the perceptron model should be replaced by the method fit generated. Any questions about this slide? Well, the I input, have... sorry. Oh, you can go. Oh, sorry, the, 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 the input format PNG is that uh, in, in a uh, network, is that actually represent a, by a vector of intensity for? No, the... no, no PNG, uh, PNG is just, it's just a format, image format. It can be anything, whatever, all the, both images and labels, just the format of the image file, right? It could be okay. PNG, it could, could be JPG, but I have uh, data in the, or it could be TIFF format, but uh, it does not re uh, uh, refer to the, what, what it is, image or binary mask. It's just image form. Okay. Thanks. Um, are there any metrics that um, you would look at that would indicate overfitting? Like, how do you know that your model has overfit and that it's not something wrong with the data or something else? Um, I would say practically what, what you could do is just to try to increase your uh, size of your training data set, for example, or if you're dealing with augmentation, increase the augmentation rate instead of uh, multiplying the increasing the size of image by say 20 fold, try 40 fold and compare the results. If you do not see the difference, then you should be fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, no more questions. I proceed to the next slide, which is actually presents us, gives us an overview of the actual UNET model. Uh, you see it as pretty sophisticated model. Uh, this network takes as input as the training step, takes as input a grayscale images and outputs, uh, at the output, it is shown the binary mask. So during training procedure, the model learns adjust parameters so as to produce the binary masks. It learns to produce the binary masks. At the prediction step, the model given is given only the grayscale images, and it will be actually predict the binary mask already with already available training. And by looking at this network, we can make several observations. The first observation is that the network U-shaped, and it involves two, uh, basically two paths of data flow. The first is the path along the U-shape, this U, and the second is horizontal transfer of information shown by gray errors. Uh, second observation is that the U-path uh, comprises two, actually two parts, the contracting downsampling part and expanding upsampling part. At the downsampling path, we uh, iterate, uh, iteratively reduce the size of image. The original image had size XY, then after contraction, which is by the way, performed by this uh, uh, layer called max pooling, uh, the brown arrow. Uh, we reduce the size of tensors 
the xy size by one half or twofold. Uh, so then at the next similar max pooling, it's one, a quarter of original size and so on. In the expanded up upsampling part, we do kind of opposite by using upsampling to the uh, layer. So we return eventually to the original size of image. That's what the U shape is basically doing. Uh, the next observation is that the concatenation, the, the gray arrows actually re represent the concatenation transformation that we are a little bit familiar with from the mini uh, UNET model that I mentioned previously. The concatenation transformation glues together, takes one input tensor, takes the other input tensor, and produces a sandwich of the two input tensors. And final observation is that although the entire network is pretty complex, it actually can be subdivided into nine blocks uh, with very similar transformation. So kind of repeated blocks. Uh, uh, each of these blocks includes at least two uh, convolutions. Convolutions are shown uh, by a red arrow, convolution operation. We will look at it late in a short while. And uh, in addition to convolution, maybe something else, uh, we are something else, maybe either max pooling, which performs this reduction of the uh, XY size of the tensors, or it could be upsampling that performs increasing the XY size. Uh, we will look at each of those layers in detail, what this layer is doing, but we start with convolution, two-dimensional convolution because it is a building block, the most important uh, layer for the network. Uh, obviously, the network is convolutional because of convolution, and also because convolution is the only layer out of the four which involves adjustable parameters. So uh, it's when we train the model, we actually train the parameters of convolution. All other layers do not involve any adjustable parameters. Any questions? No, okay, I go to the next slide, which will discuss the convolution uh, transformation or convolution layer. In the two-dimensional convolution, uh, we take as input uh, a uh, uh, image and uh, uh, we have a sliding uh, window called filter or kernel. The window slides over the input image and at each position of the filter, uh, a weighted sum of pixel values of the filter is computed plus certain bias. Uh, and the result is assigned to the appropriate pixel of the output image. The weights and the bias here are adjustable parameters. They will be automatically adjusted during training the entire network. Whereas the size of the kernel uh, or uh, is uh, not adjustable, it's hyperparameter. It has to be chosen by us. In the example shown here, the size of the output image is obviously smaller than the size of the input image. In some cases, we may, we may want the two images to be of the same size. For that case, we need to slide the filter beyond the original image. And that margin here is termed padding. So for this example, the padding, according to Keras, called same because it results in the same size of the input and output image. For previous example, the padding was called valid when the output has smaller size than input. Yet another important hyperparameter of the uh, two-dimensional convolution is strike. The strike is a step that we use when we slide the filter. For example, in this case, stride will be two because we jump every time it jumps across two pixels. In the previous two examples, the stride was one. So stride is yet another hyperparameter of convolution. And finally, in some cases, we may want uh, to use not all of the pixels of the filter, but only some of them. In other words, we can force some of the weights to zero, and those weights will not be used and will not be trained. In this case, we are dealing with dilated or atros filter, and 
the uh, step that we between the pixels that will be actually used is called dilation rate, in this case, two. In though the previous, it was one. Final note about convolution is that when we perform uh, convolution, two-dimensional, for example, convolution, we usually use not just one single filter, but a number of filters are used in parallel. Each filter comes with its own set of adjustable parameters. And uh, the outputs from all of these convolutions are then stacked together. So the number of filters that will be used is the first positional parameter of conf2d layer. So in this case, I choose 64. That means the output will contain 64 uh, in z dimension will be 64. It will uh, have uh, 64 stacked two-dimensional images. Here, this is a side view. So the height of this bar represent both x and y of the image. Um, and the pattern is uh, the same in this, uh, as I choose as a parameter, same pattern, which means the uh, uh, x, y dimension of the output image would be the same as the x, y dimension of the input image, like in this case. Any questions about this slide? Uh, how do you de determine the padding and then the stride? Is it the stride, the stride is the step. We just pass the stride, the stride to the parameter. I, so I did not show it here, but basically you say stride equals two. So you basically the user defined defined this you, you parameters. Say it's, a stride is hyperparameter. So it is set by you, by researcher. Okay. Okay. So you pass it. I, for this example of function, of course, I specify just a limited number of parameters that are passed to, uh, to the convolution 2D. There is uh, there's dots means there are other options that you can specify. You can specify stride equals two or for two dimensional can specify it as a tuple two comma two, for example. Uh, and like the same dilation rate, uh, the same, yet another parameter. There's a number of uh, uh, options for Conf2D. They are, can be found on the web. On, uh, I'll, I'll, at the end of talk, I'll give you uh, links. Could you Any explain the kernel size? Oh, kernel size. Uh, kernel size is just uh, uh, size three in this case. It could be any number that you choose. It's your hyperparameter. It's your choice. Uh, uh, so it's just this uh, uh, x and y size of the filter. Uh, I'm not not sure. Is something not clear for you in this? I thought it's pretty obvious. No. Yep, I got it. Thanks. Excuse uh, me. What what is the stack size? The stack. Yeah, stack size. Yeah, stack, stack size. Uh, so uh, our input image was just two dimensional, which means the Z dimension, X, Y dimension will be some non-zero values, but the Z dimension was one because it's two dimensional, not three dimensional, two dimensional image. When we perform convolutions of that image, we do not just one convolution, but multiple 64 convolutions with different 64 filters. And so we have, uh, number of weights uh, equal to 10 because one, one convolution has 10 weights, right? Three by three plus, plus bias. And in this case, it will be uh, 64, uh, 640 different weights. And the output from each of those convolutions is one layer here. So total, you stack them together along Z axis and uh, you have this now, three-dimensional tensor as output instead of two-dimensional input. OK, got it. Thank you. OK. Uh, what kind of filters are applied to your input image? Is it user-defined, or does it have certain uh, prerequisite filters that you use? Or well, is... why, why you use a filter of this given size? And no, no, uh, like what kind of uh, filters? Like, is it a sharpening, blurry, or? Because I, because if you have uh, some sort of filter, like if you want a blur image, you would use a blur filter with prerequisite side of a kernel. The filter that I described, please ask questions about the current slide. 
the filter that uh, I show exact, performs exactly what, what is shown in this, in this formula, right? So you take uh, a filter has nine weights plus bias. So uh, you just multiply the weight by the value of the corresponding input pixel and you get the result and assign it to the output. That's it. Um, I have a question. So uh, actually what you say is not accurate because uh, the three examples in the bottom are different filters and they are within the same slide. I mean, they, they have different res results, right? So uh, filter is any, any convolution that you do to the image. Now the question is, what is the criterion that you use to select one particular convolution on, on, or, or another one? So how do you actually arrive to the, the uh, series of filters or the series of convolutions you're going to be uh, applying? Well, I understand the question is, how do we choose that we want, say, 64 filters, but not, for example, 10 filters, right? No. Is that what your question? What's the criterion to, to decide whether you're going to be using a dilation rate of two or you're going not to be using dilation rate, but you're going to be using a, a filter without dilation or you know any of those? Oh, oh I see. Delayed filter, non delayed filter. Oh, well, uh, I can only illustrate with some examples. You will see in class number four, we will discuss delayed filter. You will see what is the purpose of using dilation deleted filter. And from that example, you may try to figure out whether or not it's relevant to your particular application. It's just illustration. It's hard to say in one word or in one phrase uh, how you decide on uh, uh, that it should be deleted. But I will just show you example. This is course by example, right? So the example will come. For now, I just mentioned that this option exists and uh, we will come to it later. Do you, have an option of actually, do you have an option to actually learn the, uh, the, the, the noise uh, model for your system so that you can actually apply it to amplify the, the, the data set? I didn't understand the question. I guess it, it, it you know, maybe when, when you go to a more general area, you know, you had in the previous slide, you had a, you know, the, the, the way you actually amplify your data set by reducing the probability of overfitting. And uh, my, my question is, is, you know, some systems have an intrinsic noise model that cannot be really, uh, it, it's not linear or easy to describe in a function. Now, the question is, we've learned that, that noise model from noise essentially obtained with that system of measurement and then uh, apply that, that model to amplify your data set. Uh, uh, we are talking so far about um, uh, noise in the data, not noise in the model. The models that we use are deterministic. So far, were deterministic. There are some noise, uh, later one will look at models with some noise. But basically, so far, we're talking about uh, deterministic models, deterministic layers. And uh, I, when I said um, uh, uh, that we, want, we don't want to fit the noise, I, I did mean the noise in the data. Right. But the noise in the data depends on the system that you use to obtain the data. The data. So for instance, in, a, in an electron microscope, the, there is a model for how noise is, uh, or there, there, there is a model, there is a way, there is a proce process of noise generation based on the method that you use for measurement. So sometimes that, that noise is understood, sometimes that noise is not quite understood, or, is, or the dimensions of that noise are many. So, you know, the, the ways you, you propose to increase the, the size of the data set by tilting or, or, or stretching it in different uh, ways is one way of going about it. The other way of going about it will be to learn what the noise for that particular measuring system is and then apply that noise model. So that's what I, what I was wondering. Well, you know, the, the, the tilting and, and, and all those are, are somehow you're defining some source for that, that variation 
uh, that that you expect to see in your data. One of we, the we again come to discussion. I'm sorry. Okay. We get, we're talking about some abstract that is not directly relevant to the presentation of the slide. I suggest that we discuss it after the uh, talk. Okay. Don't go away from the slide. Uh, we will talk about other way in a short while about other way of overfitting. The augmentation is not the only one, of course. We will talk later about other ways. But basically, what I wanted to say about overfitting that um, one way to uh, avoid it is to have uh, um, a very large data set. So you won't be able to fit every detail in all your data if data set is very big. Uh, even if your model has plenty of uh, adjustable parameters, you will not be able to fit all of the data. But if the data set is small, then you can fit every uh, single point in the data. Uh, so uh, augmentation would be a way to avoid that overfitting because of the small data set. But uh, later on, we'll look at another way of fighting overfitting. Um, I have one question. Um, I, I still couldn't understand this 64 um, number of filters tag size. Is it like, um, we will have 64 different layers with this structure? No, 64, uh, the, the input, your input is two dimensional image. X, Y, and Z is one, two dimensional. Now you try to perform convolution on that single input, that single input, uh, input image, but you perform not one, not, not one uh, 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 filter, but you use 64 different filters, do exactly the same procedure, but with 64 different filters, and each filter comes with its own set of weights. So the total number of weights would be 64 times the number of weights of one uh, uh, filter. And for each of these filters, you get one uh, two-dimensional output. But because you have total 64 filters, you will have 64 two-dimensional images. And then you stack them together, as shown in the chat in this slide. And you have, instead of two-dimensional input tensor, you now have three-dimensional tensor with the same x, y dimension, but with uh, uh, 64 z dimension. Is that clear? Yes, thank you. OK. Any other questions? OK, I proceed to the next slide. So we looked, uh, uh, take a brief look at the convolution, which is uh, uh, the fundamental building block of convolutional network which involves adjustable parameters. But there are also three other layers that we did not look yet, but they are part of the UNET model. Uh, and we will now discuss what these uh, uh, layers are doing. The first layer that we discussed was max pooling there. That layer that decreases the x, y dimensions of the images, the, the uh, uh, contracted part of the u, u, uh, u path. So, what Max Pullen is doing is it extracts windows from the input image. This is blue is input image. It extracts windows of certain size, the, the size two by two, because we specified pool size two by two. And from each window, it picks only the highest value. For this window, it's three. So it keeps only three. For the second window, it was five. So we could keep five. In the third window, it was seven. So we'll pick on the seven and so on. So uh, basically, a part of uh, what is basically the purpose of Max Pullen? Obviously, it's, first of all, it's reduction of size of the image. But there is yet another purpose, important purpose, is um, when we um, keep only the highest value, hopefully the most important value from each window, and throw away all other values, we effectively reduce the complexity of our model. And the less complex model is less likely to overfit data. And so 
the purpose of max pooling is to aggressively downsample data to prevent the model from overfitting. So it, yet another way of reduce overfitting is basically to reduce the number of parameters, of adjustable parameters of the model. And that's basically what we are doing here. Uh, if model has very few parameters, it's unlikely to fit every single point in the data. It will do roughly approximate somehow, uh, uh, average some, on average approximate the data points, but not every single data point. So we will not have overfitting. The second operation, upsampling, which was shown by uh, green arrow, it performs some somewhat opposite operation. It uh, increases the size of the input image, in this case, by twofold, because we specified the size two by two. And this is performed, the purpose of this is to basically resize the images for convenience of sub subsequent transformation. Finally, the third uh, layer that we also looked is concatenation layer that we are already familiar with. That layer uh, takes a, as input a list of two or more tensors and outputs a sandwich, uh, which uh, basically glues the input uh, images together. I mean, the input tensors together. That uh, uh, operation assumes that x, y dimensions of the tensor should be the same, but the z dimension may be any. And the uh, z dimension of the output tensor will be a sum of the z dimensions of the two or more input tensors. So what is the purpose of this operation, of this layer? We will discuss it in the next slide. Any questions about this one? What's the purpose of uh, like uh, using the max value uh, instead of like average? Is that for computation easy? Average is another option, actually. You, you can do in some ways that you can do average. But max pooling, I said, the, the belief is uh, that uh, uh, the, the mass value is probably the most important. Well, at least the max pooling works well for the uh, unit model. That's why I basically consider max pooling, max value. And there are other options, but they are not relevant to the unit model that we discussed. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, next slide. UNET is not the only model that uh, is used for semantic segmentation. In the literature, there are a number of other models, and most popular of them are probably SIGNET and FCN, uh, fully convolutional network, and some others. So why did we choose UNET for uh, this class? What makes UNET special for our biological exam? Well, first of all, UNET uh, was developed, uh, development of UNET was inspired by uh, the analysis of bioimage data. Uh, if you look at this, uh, 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 images from the brain, uh, you can see that they involve a number of very different structures with different scales, with different textures, uh, ranging from the neural membranes, which are relatively thin, uh, and even smaller, thinner vesicles and microtubules inside of the cells, and two pretty large uh, uh, objects such as mitochondria with specific texture. So a good model uh, should be able to capture, to uh, uh, detect all of these objects. Uh, but there is a variety of scales, and uh, that's why UNET attempts to explore multiple different scales of data by first downsampling the data, contracting the images, and then expanding them again. So that's why basically uh, the U, uh, uh, this is basically what the UPath is doing. Um, and now let's forget for a while about this horizontal transfer, uh, the concatenation transformation, and talk only about the UPath. Let's imagine that we, uh, have uh, um, uh, straightened out the UPA. And we'll get something like this. I show it schematically. 
the uh, architecture that is uh, known as encoder-decoder architecture. We will uh, use uh, look at it in more details in class number three, when we will discuss autoencoder. Uh, but basically, what autoencoder is doing, it attempts to extract essential features from the data. And those features will be compressed in the tensor with the smallest size, with the smallest cross section. We pass the features through the network. And the, uh, uh, this smallest tensor called bottleneck will accumulate the most essential features in the data. That's basically the idea of autoencoder. But uh, what should be the size of the uh, bottleneck? Uh, this is a uh, hyperparameter. The network does not automatically uh, determine the uh, size, uh, which have to set it ourselves. And the size should be uh, good enough, uh, big enough, for storing all the essential features that we uh, extract from the data. But how, do many, how many features do we expect to be present in the data? We don't know that, right? Because there are a lot of variety of shapes, of scales, of textures. We don't know in advance how many features we, uh, the network will be attempting to extract from the data. So we don't know the size of the tensor. So uh, some of the features may not be um, uh, transmitted through the bottleneck. Uh, for that particular case, the authors of UNET prudently added these uh, shortcuts to the network. Uh, the shortcuts actually represented by gray arrows, the same as here. The shortcuts allow to communicate the features that were not uh, uh, transmitted through the bottleneck. So hopefully no important features will be lost and uh, that's why the UNET model was very successful. Uh, it uh, actually won uh, the competition, the ISBI challenge in 2015, and is now the, probably the most popular uh, network uh, to be used for analysis of biological data. In summary, the uh, purpose of the concatenation transformation or the shortcuts is uh, the, to communicate the features that were not transmitted through the bottleneck of the network. The bottleneck in our model is somewhere here. Any questions about this slide? So uh, basically when you're going through the UNET model, um, what you're really doing is that not only are you providing the down and up sampling um, to make a simple uh, and concise model, you're also uh, using these shortcuts uh, in the concatenation steps to make sure that the model is more accurate. That's right, that's right, that's absolutely correct. Yes, uh, we do shortcuts to make sure that it did not miss any important features because ideally, if we would know the size of the, uh, how many features we want to store, uh, we would uh, 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 set the size of bottleneck set tensor to number of elements should be the same as number of essential features. But because we don't know how many essential features to expect, we just uh, uh, um, ensure ourselves by using the shortcuts. If the feature is not transmitted through the bottleneck, it will, be, um, uh, will go through the shortcuts. And hopefully we will not lose anything important. Thank you. If we have a customized set of images for segmentation and want to adapt to the UNET, what will be fixed there? What is um, to be changed? Like the hyperparameter, do you need to, to change it uh, to fit your model? Uh, the question is, I understand what uh, hyperparameters you may want to tweak in the model, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So in our implementation of UNET, Probably the most important hyperparameter is the number of uh, uh, filters that we use in. By the way, I didn't mention it, but you could, you might uh, be able to notice from the picture that, uh, say, we start here from the uh, that's very first image. The input image has dimension z dimension one, but the next one, the tensor that we produce is f 
F is uh, in our implementation is starting number of filters. And then the entire uh, unit uses the number of filters, the convolutions use the number of filters, which is multiple of that F. So the most important, I would say, parameter, hyperparameter that we can tweak in the uh, uh, unit model is this starting number of filters. You see, in the second convolution, in the second block, the, uh, it's the uh, uh, number of filters will be 2F, then 4F, then 8F, and so on. But every time they are multiple of the F. So default value for F in our model is 64. But you can change it. It's a command line option. You can set it to any number. Um, and uh, other parameters, there's a number of parameters uh, that involved, in which we can discuss at the practical part when we'll see how to run this model. And also, you can look at the uh, UNET uh, web page on BioWolf. It describes the available options. I'd like to ask you, what is the structure of the shortcuts? What is what? How does that? Is it a a vector? Is it what is that? How is that made up, and how is it communicated effectively as this, the data is transformed over this U? No, no, the, the shortcuts are exactly concatenation transformations. So the shortcut, which is concatenation, I just call it, that's a, the, the same term. Basically, I use uh, uh, shortcut or concatenation uh, interchangeably. Uh, so what it is doing is taking this uh, last uh, light blue tensor as one of inputs, and this tensor as the second input. So we have as input two, a list of two tensors. And the output would be this sandwich tensor, which we glued together. The original images were of, uh, oh, by the way, it's not right, because there's some more transformations. But anyway, the input images were of, uh, uh, of the z dimension f. The output will be 2f. Is that clear? Or? Uh, I'll I'll keep listening, but maybe okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, there is a I have a backup slide that explains in more details how we perform coding of the unit model, and we can discuss. I'm very happy to discuss it. Uh, right now, I thought that maybe not all of the students will be interested in going that far into details, but everyone is welcome. I'll be happy to show you that backup slide and comment on how we. Uh, I will show you the, uh, the network itself and a, a code snippet that implements that part of the network. And hopefully that will be enough for you to understand what we're doing, actually. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? I have a question about the F again. Um, so when it's these, these filters it's co collecting are all from doing the same convolution on the same kind of like field of view for that chunk, for that like batch, right? right? So how are you, how is the the convolution process changing enough that each of these filters are gonna have like unique and interesting data or are some of them gonna be copies of different layers in the same filter set? Uh, the, you, are you talking about the weights of the filter? Yeah, like are some of these going to have the same weights just by nature of the convolution being done or? I would say in general, all of them would have uh, most likely very different weights. And the weights are adjusted automatically depending on your data. It's hard to imagine, uh, uh, to predict in mind what exactly that would be because the uh, adjustment of weights of a given filter will depend on all other filters. That's a single network. When we do uh, training, uh, the particular weight, uh, it's, it's not just one convolution, but basically the uh, uh, feedback is going from the output. We, we put the image, the grayscale image the input, and we uh, put the ground truth labels or ground truth mask at the output. And whenever our current iteration produces something different from the mask, that difference will be captured and will be transmitted back to the, uh, all the other convolution parameters. And the par every parameter of every filter will be readjusted. 
And that procedure will continue and will repeat it multiple times. So it's not just one filter sets up uh, uh, weights by, by itself. It's, it's just a unit, uh, a single network, uh, a one, one big structure. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, next slide. Uh, now, I mentioned uh, in the one of the introductory uh, uh, steps, uh, and, and part of the introductory part, mentioned that in order for a model to compile, we have to specify uh, at least two pieces of information. One is the loss function, and the other is optimizing. We will look at the examples of optimizers and different from SGD, uh, stochastic gradient descent and others. We will look at subsequent classes, but this uh, slide discusses uh, the one example of the loss function, the loss that was uh, uh, used for the UNET model and it works very well. So that loss basically uh, measures the difference uh, between uh, the ground truth labels and the labels that our model predicts. Here, the ground truth labels are designated Y. Uh, the index I corresponds to pixel. So summation in the formula is performed over all the pixels in the image. This image, it has 256 by 256 in our example. There's that many pixels. And we do summation over all the pixels. YI is uh, a value of ground truth, uh, either zero or one, because it's black and white. And uh, PI is our predicted uh, labels, which have the meaning of probability. So they're not one or zero, but they usually between zero and one, closer to one or closer to zero. And this formula uh, actually has a wonderful property. Uh, it can be shown that this function as a function of uh, PIs, the P is our adjustable parameters, which depend on the weights which we adjust, has one global minimum. And that minimum uh, uh, is reached when PIs are exactly equal to YIs. That's wonderful property because uh, we do not have local minima. There is only one minimum and it is global. And that can be seen by analyzing this formula. First, if we just take this uh, entire expression and differentiate it with respect to PI, we will get uh, it's negative uh, for PI less than YI or positive when PI more than YI, which means the function looks like, like this. And the value at the minimum will be zero because of the other limiting case, when PI is exactly YI, we can see from this formula that the value of the corresponding, uh, the, the, the portion of the loss function corresponding to one pixel will be zero. Just yeah. substitute, substitute into this formula and you will get this result. So the value is zero. So the total function is a sum of contributions from different pixels and each of the contribution would have uh, a minimum equal to zero if and only if the uh, uh, PI, our predicted weight, exactly equals the ground truth label. The other two important functions, uh, properties of this function is the behavior of that function when PI is different, very different from YI. So if, for example, uh, y and P are on the opposite side of the interval zero one, then uh, the loss from each uh, at each pixel tends to plus infinity. And the same if, uh, if the two uh, are on the opposite side, quite opposite, Y is zero and P is one. And in summary, I already mentioned that uh, the main conclusion is that uh, the uh, binary cross entropy loss function has a single minimum and do not have any local minima. And this is wonderful property for this function because this is what we want to minimize during the training procedure. So we will not be stuck in local minima. We will go directly to the global minimum. 
Any questions? Uh, yes, wouldn't wouldn't that only hold if the function p of w is a linear function of the weights? Uh, k w p, p. p of w. Oh, p p p w p is actually uh, the uh, p would be probability. So whatever its probability, it's complex function because w is actually a vector, right? It's right. not just one variable. It's a vector of maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, weights. Uh, so uh, we uh, do not uh, care right now about how P depends on W, on the weight. But what we care about is that P is, whatever weights are, P is always in the interval between zero and one, because it has a meaning of probability. And uh, then um, uh, for W, it doesn't matter. All this, uh, uh, yes, all these properties will hold, regardless of how P depends on the weights. Any other questions? No. Well, this is actually concludes, concludes the main part of the presentation. Uh, now, it's a slide illustrates how we can practically run the UNET code on BioWolf. More details can be available here. This is a link to the UNET uh, readme file, readme page. Uh, but basically, you allocate an uh, interactive session on uh, the GPU. Then you load model UNET. Uh, and then you compare the data, the data that I mentioned, copy them to your current folder. Uh, uh, and then you train, predict, or visualize. There are three executables. By typing train minus H, you will see a number of options that are available in the, for the training procedure. And examples of how you can run it are available on this page. We will look at those examples at the practical part, if you stay. And I will probably uh, answer your possible additional questions. And uh, that code also can be run not using not a single GPU, but uh, uh, four GPUs. And the procedure is similar, but you allocate interactive session with four uh, GPUs and uh, do the same uh, with uh, the difference. May four, two also, two, up to four, up to four. So uh, you additionally specify a minus G uh, option, which shows how many GPUs are going to use in the training procedure. And after you're done training, uh, training will produce uh, a checkpoint file. Uh, but I have already available checkpoint file. So you don't have to train yourself. If you want, it's OK. But uh, you can use already pre-computed uh, checkpoint files to perform predictions from uh, the model. The model will predict, uh, will be take the grayscale images and will predict these kind of labels. And then you can visualize the uh, uh, the uh, both the uh, binary labels that we predicted. And you may also make this colored picture. But again, as I mentioned previously, we optionally color different regions, but that does not mean that we assign different labels for, to different regions. They all have the same semantic meaning. They are all assigned the same labels. And we have two data sets, data ISBI and data HHMI. Upon this command, you will see them in your current folder. Any questions? No. Uh, that concludes. Yes. Okay. So uh, the data I didn't catch this. So can we run this in our own on our own data? Of course. Of course. Well, uh, your data should be. Uh, should fit some requirements. We can talk about it in the practical part. The most important requirement is the size of the input images. Actually, probably you can run with any size. Probably yes, because there is a parameter, input parameter. By default, uh, we assume that the size of images should be uh, 512 by 512 or 256 by 256. Uh, it depends, uh, depending on how you want to run the uh, model. But 
uh, you have options uh, of the, for the X size and Y size. And probably if you uh, uh, set those options to your size of your data, you should be able to run on your data. But I didn't try so far any other data except those that I have. So if there are issues with that, I, I will be happy to fix for you. It should, should work. All right, thank you. And this pro uh, summary provides the overview of what we just uh, discussed during the uh, presentation. We uh, first we had the introduction to Keras using Perceptron as a simple example. Instead of hello world, this is used often in uh, uh, computer science. Uh, so Perceptron was our uh, uh, main uh, basic example. Uh, then we uh, discussed the notion of tensors and layers. Uh, parameters and hyperparameters. We introduced two simple layers, uh, dense and activation. Uh, we discussed two approaches to building the uh, networks or models and Keras, functional API and sequential construct. We uh, discussed the uh, uh, branched uh, um, networks, and we mentioned I mentioned that uh, for branched networks. Only functional API approach can be used, whereas uh, uh, for unbranched network, both functional API and sequential construct approach will be appropriate. And I introduced the notion of hidden layers uh, and deep network. Deep network, remember, it's a network with at least two hidden layers with adjustable parameters. And then we discussed semantic segmentation. We looked at UNET model. A number of other uh, layers were introduced for four actually different layers. Uh, we discussed the augmentation procedure that uh, uh, increases the effective size of our training data set and uh, uh, prevents the model from overfitting. And uh, what else? Loss function. We discussed the loss function for binary segmentation, which worked well. Thank you. Any other questions? 